Hi guys, it's Mr. Y. This is part two of our biochemistry lecture. Um, so if you haven't watched part one yet, make sure you go back and do that and then come back here and we'll finish up with part two. So just a very brief review before we go on. Remember monomers are the individual links, polymers are the entire chain, and the monomers go together to make the chains. Um, one quick note, the first one we're going to go into is called nucleic acids. Nucleic acids are the polymers, the long chains, they were made up of monomers called nucleotides. So nucleotides are the monomers, nucleic acids are the polymers. So nucleotides, that's again the links, make up nucleic acids and the most common nucleic acid you probably know of is DNA. Um, the nucleotides, the monomers themselves, are composed usually of a 5-carbon sugar, that's right here, a phosphate group right here, and a nitrogenous base right here. So as I said before, the main polymers, the main nucleic acids that you would know of for this would be DNA and perhaps its uh, other form RNA. These are made of individual nucleotides and their job is to store and transmit genetic information and you can see I've circled the nucleotide here for this DNA molecule. Again you can see the bases, the nitrogenous bases in yellow and the sugars there and then the phosphate groups are along the outside of the DNA chain. These are the four main nucleotides we're going to be covering in class eventually. Uh, we're going to hit a lot of this when we get to genetics, so I'm not going to spend too much time on here now. Um, but you will see these again, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thiamine. These are four different types of nucleotides. All right, on to our last polymer, proteins. This is going to take us a little while, so I wanted to spend as much time on this as I could. Uh, proteins are the polymer, the monomers are called amino acids. So amino acids are the links, the long chain is called proteins. And amino acids come in lots of different forms, at least 20 different types. And again, like with the nucleotides, they come in the same standard pattern. They always have, and you can see in this picture, an amino group, or carboxyl group, and what they call the R group. That's this section right down here. The R group is the variable group. That's what makes each amino acid different from another amino acid. So the other two groups, the amino group, the carboxyl group, is the same. The center group is usually just a carbon with a hydrogen. It's the R group that's kind of like the variable group that changes things. So the structure is always the same again. The amino group, the carbon in the middle, the carboxyl group, and the R group is what changes amino acids one from another. And when you put a whole bunch of amino acids together, that's where you start to get proteins. <clears throat> Just reinforcing, you can see here, here's uh, amino acid called alanine and another one called serine. You can see they have the same exact amino group, carboxyl group is the same. The only thing that's different, the R group here. That's what changes between amino acids. And there are 20 different amino acids. Um, a lot of them are used in biology, and uh, almost all of them, eventually, you're going to have some experience with. The amino acids themselves are linked together in what we call a dehydration reaction. They pull out water, you can see here, and they link together through what we call a peptide bond. So, <clears throat> proteins have a very, very specific order for their amino acids. They have a very specific way the links have to be lined up so that it can form a very complex shape. It's hard not to show this without a visual, but the shape is what gives proteins the ability to perform their different functions. Different proteins have different jobs. And so when two amino acids form together and form that peptide bond, they determine the shape that the, the uh, protein is eventually going to take and what job it's eventually going to be able to do, or even if it can do its job properly. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. When you have a lot of amino acids chained together, a lot of times this is called a poly, remember poly means many, many polypeptide uh, chain. Uh, proteins are composed of one or more polypeptide chains. Again, these are just long chains of amino acids.
So I like this poster just because it shows the different um, levels of the protein structure. So we have the primary protein structure. These are just the individual amino acids linked together through peptide bonds. And then they can fold in different ways depending on which amino acids you get along the chain. So they can do this little alpha helix spinning thing or they can do a pleated sheet fold system over here. And it all depends on the hydrogen bonds. Remember hydrogen bonds, they are very weak, but they form very easily and they form in large, large numbers often. And then you can actually zoom out even more to see an entire what we call tertiary structure. Tertiary means third level structure. And when you take a few of these tertiary structures and place them together, you have yourself a completed protein through its quaternary structure. So again, this is just running through the quick structures in a zoomed up form. Here's the amino acids. They will determine how this thing eventually folds in either to the alpha helix or the beta, beta pleated sheets, and that eventually will determine its final shape. The final shape will determine what job the protein can do. Here's the secondary structure again. You see the alpha helix or the pleated sheets. Again, that's all based upon these hydrogen bonds along the way here and here. Here's the tertiary structure, and these are also um, come about because of hydrogen bonds, but also because of some disulfide bonds right there. You don't need to worry too much about them. Just know that if the amino acid here is suddenly moved down a spot, maybe the disulfide bridge, this bridge in yellow, comes here. Now the shape is slightly different. Again, the quaternary structure is where you see the actual final shape of the protein. This is what truly determines what job, what function the protein will have. So remember, 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 I will repeat this many times, the amino acid order eventually determines the protein shape, and the protein shape determines its function. So the order determines the shape, the shape determines the function. This is especially important when we hit genetics. Now here's just three different layouts of how complex proteins can look when you model them. This is the exact same protein no matter uh, how you model it, but it's just different layers of complexity. And just remember that this shape came about as a result of the amino acid order. So the order determined the shape, and the shape will determine what job this protein has inside of a cell. So order determines shape, shape determines function. Keep in mind, it is possible to mess up the shape of proteins. And when you do that, of course, the protein can't do its job. We call that denaturing the protein. Denaturing can happen um, when you put a protein in acid, so you would disrupt the hydrogen bonds, or when you disrupt the ionic bonds or the disulfide bridges, when you expose it to excessive heat or changes uh, in, like I said, the pH. Um, anybody who's ever had a high temperature that's required you to go to the hospital when your temperature is usually about 103 and it stays that high for a long period of time, especially when you're young, that usually means you should be going to a hospital. And the reason why is because the proteins in your brain can actually denature. They can break apart and lose their shape. And when that happens, you can actually suffer, suffer from some mental retardation because the proteins won't go back to normal um, once they've denatured. So Anybody who has a high temperature that hot for that long, usually they send them to the hospital and the first thing they do is put in fluids to try and cool the person down so that the proteins in your brain don't actually end up cooking themselves. So proteins are, without a doubt, the hardest working molecule in the cell. They do everything. They are the grunts. They, if there's a job to do, usually there's somehow a protein involved. So these is, this is just a small list of their potential functions for um, the cell. There is a whole lot more that I'm not going into. So structural support, they help the cell keep its shape. Many cells have to have a very specific shape like liver cells. Proteins are actually involved in making sure the, shell, the cell stays in the proper shape. Storage, a lot of proteins will store help store different things like energy um, sources, food, they help in transportation across the cell membrane. You can see there's a protein molecule here helping with the transportation into and out of the cell. Sensory receptions, that is to say communication, how cells talk to each other is often done by proteins. We'll get into that when we talk about neurons. Um, contractional movements, so the protein is actually what makes up a good portion of your muscular system. So um, proteins are what tell the fibers in your muscles to actually contract 
pore to expand so your muscles um, get smaller or larger. Your immune system, your T cells, that's your white blood cells and your red blood cells, are all using proteins in their cell membranes to recognize diseases so they can um, deal with those diseases when you're, they infect your body. Gene regulation, how to tell which genes to turn off and when, a lot of times comes down to proteins knowing when to turn on a certain part of DNA and when to ignore another part of DNA. And the last one that I'm going to emphasize for a little while, enzymes. Enzymes are really important in um, biology. So enzymes, they are what we call catalysts. And key part, if you need a help remembering, catalysts, cat. Um, they help reactions speed up. Now, they don't cause reactions to happen. They just cause reactions to happen faster. Enzymes are, for lack of a better analogy, they're like cheetahs. They're all about speed. And they work by a physical um, fit system, a lock and key structure kind of. So if you think of an old style lock with an actual key, that's kind of how enzymes work. The enzymes um, a lot of times have to be the lock and the substrate is the key. We'll go about that in the next, we'll talk about that more in the next slide. And they do this because they reduce what we call the activation energy, the energy required to make the reaction go. They lower it so it's much easier to get the energy needed to make that reaction occur so it happens a lot faster. Many of the, many of the reactions in your cells without enzymes would happen way too slow and your cells would die before the reactions even got started. Um, after the reaction, and here's another great uh, part about enzymes, the enzyme typically is released and it's unchanged so it can be reused again and again and again and again as long as it has uh, energy if it needs it and enough substrate to activate it. So um, that's the basic breakdown of what enzymes do. Uh, keep in mind enzymes, if they have a name, they usually end in ASE. You'll see that as we go. So these diagrams, uh, or animations, excuse me, will show the basic idea of an enzyme. The enzymes will be in the yellow. This spot here is called the active site, and these are substrates trying to fit into the active site. You saw the first two didn't fit. So the enzymes are very specific. Like I said, it's like a lock and key um, specificity for what substrates actually activate the enzymes. Now, the uh, active sites where the substrate binds to the enzymes can sometimes cause the reaction to break apart or sometimes it can actually put things together. It really just depends on the enzyme and what its specific job is. And as I said, enzymes um, can be broken down by excessive pH. This is acid up here that they're putting this enzyme in and you'll see it changes the shape and when you change the shape the substrate no longer fits. So you have a substrate, an active site, and if the shape doesn't match, the enzyme can't do its job. This is why the order of the amino acids is so important. The order determines the shape, the shape determines the function. And keep in mind that all enzymes are proteins. Remember I said enzymes are like cheetahs? Well, all cheetahs are cats. All enzymes are proteins. But not all proteins are enzymes, just like not all cats are cheetahs. There can be lions, there can be tigers. But all cheetahs are cats, and all, all enzymes are proteins, but not all proteins are enzymes. They can do other things, and just like not all cats are cheetahs. So here's another um, set of diagrams showing how uh, enzymes, again in the yellow, are very specific to the structure of their substrate. Sometimes they can be combining two or more things, and in fact, in some types, if you look in this bottom one, they can actually be inhibited. They can be blocked, so they stop working. This is a way the cell can actually turn off enzymes when it doesn't need to. It can actually send out blocking mechanisms. Inhibitors is what we call them. Okay guys, that wraps up part two for biochemistry. Again, make sure you go back and watch part one if you haven't already and ask questions in class if you need to get any more help.